three men, one with shovel. In September 1813, American troops finally buried their dead. Some had been killed during the Battle of the River Raisin. Some struck down in revenge killings the next morning. For eight months, they'd been left unburied. But even the burial was not the end. It was just the beginning. The beginning of one of the darkest eras of history. White letters on black, removal. In the wake of the killings of the River Raisin, the young nation was gripped with revulsion, anger, and fear. The settlers' anxieties turned into a political movement, led in part by a young lawyer named Lewis Cass, who had served under General William Hull in the surrender of Detroit in 1812. He had just turned 31 when President James Madison appointed him the second governor of the Michigan Territory in October 1813. He would remain territorial governor for 18 years. Soon, map of Michigan area with many red dots. The vast majority of the territory residents were native people. There were hundreds of native villages in Michigan, most of them communities of the Ottawa, Ojibwe, Ottawatomi, and Wyandotte citizens. But Lewis Cass in time would change that. He would even help bring about a change in the way many Americans regarded Native people. Rusty Davis, historian. By that point in time in American literature, Natives were referred to as noble savages, and that meant that they were uncontaminated by civilization, by society. In Cass's mind, they were not noble savages. They were just savages. Soon, illustration of a war dance. They needed to be somehow moved, contained, isolated from the rest of society because in his mind, you could not assimilate these savage people into white society. Drawing of bare-chested Indians with long knives. As Cass himself said, The Indians are impelled to war by passions. They have not only no principles of religion or morality to repress their passions. Reckless of consequence, the Indian is the child of impulse. This tract of country should be in our possession. Eric Hemingway. Lewis Cass would carry this very strong feelings towards Native throughout his whole political and military career. He would call them uncivilized, barbaric savage. Chief Billy Friend. He thought he was a true patriot, a true American, and that by killing Indians and in the manner that he did, that he was doing this country a great justice. Next, Eric Hemingway. When it came time to make these treaties, the United States did not have the intention of the natives being here in perpetuity. Removal was always in the plan. As governor, Cass coerced some 20 treaties with tribes in the Great Lakes region, taking the vast majority of native land. Again, map of Michigan region, most red dots now gone. Then, in 1828, Andrew Jackson was elected to the presidency. Jackson was an old Indian fighter who invoked the credo, a scalp for a scalp, in bloody victories over native nations. Cass continued promoting national legislation that helped Jackson pass an act to remove Native peoples from lands whites occupied or wanted to occupy. Again, Rusty Davis. Within their Indian Removal Act, the method of dealing with the Natives was to move them away from the white society and then contain them on a reservation. Eric Hemingway of Adawa Indians. Nobody owns the land, yet you have somebody coming from far away saying, the land is now mine, and it's based on this document, and also God's will. Individuals like Cass, who have this idea that removal is for the benefit of Native people, is incredibly arrogant and incredibly condescending idea that it's best for you to be away from your home because of your uncivilized nature. And I, I stress over and over how devastating and how racist and how wrong these civilization policies are towards Native peoples. And they also cross the line into being a genocidal policy. Cartoon of Cass with bloody sword and cannon firing. During two centuries, Indians have been in contact with a civilized people, but in their own moral qualities. They certainly have not advanced. Indians are wandering hordes of barbarians, people that cannot live in contact with a civilized community. Soon, portrait of a man. Many Americans of the day did not agree with Cass, 
a former army surgeon named Edwin James, hoped that native people could be incorporated into the United States. Why did the native people fight? Edwin James, quote, not because they were evil or immoral. It was because they faced encroachment and oppression. Etching, Indian with bowed head, looks at factory buildings. But Lewis Cass had friends in high places. A year after the Removal Act became law, President Andrew Jackson gave Lewis Cass a reward, thanking him for what the president saw as a job well done. Jackson made Cass his Secretary of War. In his new role, Lewis Cass forged American policy toward Native people. Map showing land west of Mississippi River, now Indian Territory. The Mississippi River would be the new dividing line between Native Territory and the United States. But even that line would not last long. In 1843, the Wyandotte, the last remaining Indian nation in Ohio, was forced out. Dr. John Steckley. The leaders argued very strongly to stay in Ohio. They tried to ensure a future, but they also must have had in front of their eyes that our future could be we disappear. Chief Billy Friend. You know, I think many times we talk about genocide and we, we think about genocide in other countries. Of course, the genocide that took place with World War II, but sometimes we neglect to realize that probably the greatest genocide that took place was right here in the United States. We have a lot of documentation concerning the Cherokee Trail of Tears, but every tribe has their own Trail of Tears. Group of Native people, some old, on March. Nearly one third of the Wyandotte removed from the Great Lakes died in Kansas in the first two years because of the unfulfilled promises of the United States. Two Native women kneel beside a body in woods as others continue to walk past them. After rebuilding in Kansas, the Wyandotte were again forced to move and today reside in Wyandotte, Oklahoma. Building on his role in the forced removal of many Native nations, Cass still managed to capture the Democratic nomination for president and almost won the election to the highest office in the land. Soon, Native people walking, heads bowed. Many Native nations endeavored to recover their history, language, and culture that was stolen from their ancestors during their forced removal and generations of mandated assimilation. Even today, Native nations continue to deal with the aftermath of the battles of the River Raisin. Again, Eric Hemingway, then Chief Billy Friend. The legacy of the War of 1812 has felt very strongly in Native communities. It might be a blip on the map of American history, but for the map of Native history, it's huge. We left nice homes, we left nice farms. Our, our kids were taken out of school or in the middle of their education. We left the churches that we attended, the friends that we had, and you know, to wake up on a, you know, a muddy bank of a river, not knowing what tomorrow's gonna hold. Chief Glenna Wallace. Tribes today still have to overcome some of the things that happened 200, 300 years ago. But we believe education is the way to teach us to learn from history. We believe that education is the, the leveler in many situations. And I'm proud to say that many of the tribes that were here in this area, the Wyandots, the Ottawas, the Shawnees. They have been the leaders in certainly Ottawa County, where I live, certainly the state of Oklahoma, of helping during difficult times. And if people like Cass and Andrew Jackson had been successful forever and ever, uh, we would not see that today. And we would not have those contributions that we have today. That was Chief Glenna Wallace, Eastern Shawnee. Credits and Aperture Films Production. Special thanks to Rusty Davis, Volunteer, River Raisin National Battlefield Park, Chief Billy Friend, Wyandotte Nation, Eric Hemingway, Director of Archives and Records, Little Traverse Bay Bands of Adawa Indians, Dr. John Steckley, Tribal Linguist, Trustee, Wyandotte Nation, Chief Glenna Wallace, Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma.